Welcome to the Marketing Society Sustainability Squad podcast, leading the conversation on ESG. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Stuart Morrison, and we shall be diving into perspectives from the media industry around ESG. Why ESG should be a concern for advertisers when buying media. Stuart started out his career in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia in the late 90s, working with EMI. He moved on to the Bertelsmann Music Group in 2000 as head of marketing, setting up their marketing operations. Subsequently, was appointed managing director in 2004, and after the merger with Sony Music, became GM of Sony BMG Music. In his role, he sat on the board of the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry, guiding policy, establishing industry operating principles, and lobbying policymakers in order to protect music and intellectual property rights in the region. Subsequently, Stuart joined Nokia in 2007 as they grew their EMEA regional presence, identifying appropriate marketing partnerships, negotiating commercial agreements, and ensuring corporate governance. After the acquisition of Nokia by Microsoft in 2012, he continued to be responsible for marketing agency partnerships. Subsequently, he joined Unilever in 2015, responsible for the appointment and performance management of marketing agencies in Name Trub and retail partners globally, and was a member of the World Federation of Advertisers Middle East chapter. Lastly, <laughs> since 2019, Stuart has been Managing Director of Firm Decisions Middle East and Africa, the audit division of the world's largest marketing and media performance consultancy, Abriquity PLC, which is listed on the London Stock Exchange, working for 70 of the top 100 advertisers around the world in helping shaping transparency, good governance, and excellence in their strategic advertising and marketing investments. Stuart, welcome. Wow, that, that, that about <laughs> covers it, RO. I think <laughs> that was a comprehensive uh, introduction there. That was just your Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stuart, with your vast experiences in digital marketing, every marketeer probably listening would be asking the age-old question of traditional versus digital. What's the current state of play? Okay, so maybe let's, um, let's set the scene a little bit about the sort of advertising industry. Um, obviously, there are lots of reports. It's one of those industries that everyone has an interest in. Uh, we all are impacted by it in some shape or form as consumers. Um, but let's sort of give some facts and figures. Um, in 2023, uh, the estimated global ad spend is approximately $900 billion. Wow. Depends on who you speak to, obviously. Um, and of that, approximately 600 billion of it is in the digital ad spend space. Wow. So uh, that's about a sort of six to eight percent growth year on year, uh, and that's projected to continue for the next two or three years. Where is that growth really happening? Um, digital, primarily. Um, digital is expected to grow about 10 to 11 percent, whereas sort of traditional is sort of one less than one percent. So that's sort of print and, and uh, TV and out of home type spend is predicted to be sort of less than 1%. So there's this sort of big movement from, you know, maybe 2016 and before where most of the ad spend globally and naturally in this region was all on sort of traditional, uh, maybe only 5% of ad budgets were spent in digital. It's now completely the opposite. Um, and if you think about maybe MENA more specifically, um, again, it's hard to size the market because there's so many different interpretations of what Middle East means to different advertisers. Um, the size of the Middle East market is, is, is estimated around $6 billion. Um, the IAB um, size digital in this region at about 50% of the ad spend. Um, so that sort of gives a sort of an understanding of where we are in the Middle East. And then of that sort of digital ad spend, around 60% of it is bought in what we call programmatic buying, right. um, which we'll come on to in a little bit. Um, and then I guess on top of that, you know, there's been a lot of change in the industry itself. Um, there are more players involved. So maybe sort of some of the traditional consultancies like Deloitte, uh, they are now in digital uh, advertising. So they set up Deloitte X. Uh, Accenture, who used to be one of the big consultancy players, I think now is probably the fourth biggest advertising company. Yeah. Um, uh, and they're now really starting to challenge maybe some of the large advertising agencies. And then we've got maybe some of the big players that everyone knows as sort of household names, uh, Meta, Google, Amazon, 
uh, they're now encouraging advertisers to sort of spend directly with them. You know, so if you're a mom and pop store um, selling cakes or flowers, they want your business. They want you to be buying ads on their platforms and they're making it very, very easy for advertisers of any sort of size to use their tools and technology to buy those ads. It's in their interest to do so, actually. Um, and of course, on top of that, there are other changes taking place. Many advertisers starting to in-house um, parts of their marketing spend. Digital is naturally one of those areas that they um, think they can do themselves. Uh, but you're always going to need some sort of outside sort of strategic help to, to kind of make that happen. And then I guess um, with all of that move to digital, one of the big issues is the amount of intermediaries involved. Um, back in the day, it used to be very simple. You know, an advertiser would go to their advertising agency, their media buying agency and say, hey, buy me ads on NBC TV. <laughs> And they would go off and negotiate and buy the ads and, hey, presto, the ads were, were there, you know, when you're watching seven o'clock primetime television. Um, that's changed now. Um, there are an awful lot of companies involved in buying, selling, creating, understanding what websites are there, ad exchanges that offer that inventory, supply side platforms that sell inventory, demand side platforms that buy that inventory and a whole host of sort of supporting intermediaries. Uh, all that is nibbling away at an advertiser's budget, uh, just getting that that ad from the advertiser to your laptop screen or to your phone. So, so Stuart, regionally in the Middle East, as you reflected on some of the patterns, and we talk about more devices, uh, the behaviors here being right, there were stats saying that more people had two phones or more multiple more yeah. devices here. And we quite often see big plays on activations and out of home being prevalent here. Do you still feel that that the stats that you've referenced give us a picture of what it looks like more closer to home here in the region? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, it's um, sizing this, particularly our region, because we're a patchwork of, you know, again, depending on the, the, the company you work for, uh, we're a patchwork of, of countries. Uh, 22 is countries are sort of considered Middle East, North Africa, uh, or Arabic speaking world, if yeah. that would make more sense. Um, and, you know, for a lot of advertisers, um, achieving cut through across 20 markets is very difficult. You know, you know, your budget gets spread really thin. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are lots of media channels uh, that were available. And if you go back maybe 10, 15 years, there may have been TV, radio, out of home, print. That, you know, it was pretty contained. Uh, today, the growth in just digital media channels is phenomenal. So you've got multiple markets, multiple channels multiple um, websites and and uh, publishers within each of those channels. It makes it very difficult for an advertiser. Um, and again, if you think about, uh, although the, the sort of stats for this region are approximately 50% of digital ad spend, 50% digi of ad spent is digital. Uh, in the work we do at Firm Decisions, we are privileged to be able to audit the media and advertising agencies of many of these big advertisers, yeah. we see digital ad spend far greater than 50%. I mean, we see some as high as sort of 90%. Wow. Uh, and even in some cases, their entire budget goes to, to digital. Yeah. And in terms of sort of buying that programmatically, which is real-time bid, mm -hmm. um, we see numbers as high as 80, 90%. Wow. So again, it depends on the company, it depends on the size of their ad spend, depends on where their target markets are. 50% digital is pretty reasonable, but it's not to say that that's the be all and end all of it. The concern, obviously, when we're talking about ESG is um, there is a huge amount of energy that actually goes into keeping just the internet alive, as well as the sort of um, su supporting buying ads, showing those ads. And there's, there's a pretty good reason for it as well from an advertiser perspective. If you think you want to take reactive measures to a campaign, it's very easy for you to change a creative concept or creative asset and sell or publish that to someone's web page. Yeah. Back in the day with an out of home, for example, it's pretty difficult to take yeah. down an out of home billboard and, and change it. You know, so that's probably more of a strategic tool, but digital can be a very tactical tool as well, which is great. And you can, at least theoretically, target people better. Uh, there's a lot of questions around how good targeting is in digital, and we'll talk about that in, yeah. in a, in a yeah. while. So actually, when we talk about ESG in the media industry, 
let's reflect back a little bit. Can you tell us when, when, in your opinion, this really became a huge focus and what could have been a pivotal moment for this side of marketing? Um, my view would be, I think we're in it now. Um, I think advertising has been overlooked. You know, if you think about what's driven advertising in, in digital, it's technology. Now, I worked at Nokia yeah. in the early 2000s. We had a, a battle of devices. It was like a battle for hardware, really. Um, but it gets to a point where you can't add any more megapixels to a camera, right? You then have to start thinking about how do we, how do we keep our customers loyal? And Apple did that pretty well, you know, with the, the iTunes store and books and all of the sort of... And it becomes a battle of ecosystems. And technology is what's really enabled all of this. Once you have the device technology, you then have all of the websites and all the ways of showing ads. So that's kind of sort of how that's changed. And I think in that kind of growth, we've we've kind of given little thought to carbon emissions. Um, and I guess also we just haven't been able to quantify it historically. It's, it's just, you know, this kind of industry is far more difficult to quantify your environmental impact. Any services business is very difficult. And if you think about most of the advertisers or most of the companies, they probably started out looking at things like, you know, where their raw materials were coming from. Um, you know, did they, were they mining cobalt for, you know, for phones and, you know, what kind of materials yeah. and the supply chain yeah. was very easy to quantify your, because you can see it, right? Yeah. You can see you're digging a hole in the ground and yeah. causing environmental pollution. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of quantify an ad being shown to someone in another country on their laptop. Yeah. It's a, it's kind of a, a tricky, a tricky place to be. Um, so I think a lot of companies have kind of been looking at, you know, what we now know is to be sort of scope one and scope two, um, which is the carbon footprint of things like, you know, their office equipment, their carbon emissions for logistics and manufacturing. And if you go into the, the sort of responsible space, it's things like, you know, the well-being of their employees, paying people a, a living wage, not just the minimum wage, but yeah. a living wage. But I think now there's a, a greater move towards the sort of intangibles yeah. of a company. Um, you know, the services they buy, how do they treat their people? And some of that is driven by law. Um, I think a huge amount of it is driven by consumers. Um, you know, social media plays a huge part in that today. Yeah. You know, we get to see, you know, what goes on behind the scenes. There's no hiding from what a company does. And there's a number of examples of, you know, whistleblowers in tech companies coming forwards and saying, hey, you know, this is what we've been doing wrong. Yeah. Um, and consumers can vote with their feet in that sort of con context. Um, you know, a study we did uh, with the World Federation of Advertisers, actually, we found that 84% of consumers were more likely to buy from companies practicing sustainable advertising. So the consumers clearly uh, have it on top of their mind. You know, they, they have a conscience, right? Um, and then I guess, you know, there's a sort of an additional element to that. There's an awful lot of sort of ethical investment funds. Um, companies need to recapitalize. In order to recapitalize, there's got to be appetite to buy their shares. To buy their shares, there are people who want to know that, you know, they're buying into something they believe in and that, you know, companies are acting in their best interests and they are not part of that problem. Um, so I think, you know, the sort of phrase is, you know, companies are no longer a black box, they're a glass box. Um, and everybody gets to see now the background to how products and services are made, where they come from, uh, and they have a choice whether to buy in and own a share of those organizations as well. Um, and I think it's also worth pointing out that, you know, there's a number of notable examples over the years. You know, companies don't always own their brand. Coca-Cola was a good example years ago when they changed the formula of the Coca-Cola. Um, consumers voted with their feet and there were pictures of it being poured down the drains and Coke had to revert back to, you know, the formula. So there's kind of a good example of, of you know where consumers really can make a difference and ESG is one of those they can force change upon advertisers through voting with their feet in that context and that's exactly actually it rings a bell into deep a little bit going deep, 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 going a little bit deeper on do you feel it's consumer led brand led or is it a combination of many people trying to drive this industry towards better practices not just on environment but also which we're going to come into a little bit later, but I'll jump the gun with social and the governance factors. I think probably everybody in that supply chain, from the consumer who ultimately hands over their hard-earned cash to a company that produces the product or service they want to buy, 
who in turn funnel that through media agencies, the digital, long, long, long digital supply chain with thousands of intermediaries involved, right through to the publishers themselves. I think everybody in that supply chain has a responsibility to act correctly. Um, however, we have to also remember that that media supply chain also at the end of it helps formulate the opinion of the consumer at the start of it. It's and that's where actually you men mentioned about handing over hard earned cash, but also hard to come by data <laughs> as in this industry yeah, is true, absolutely. right? Where, where sometimes a choice hasn't been made to hand over data, but we're targeted with those ads. Yeah. You mentioned cake earlier. I wouldn't be surprised if I have an ad waiting for me now, but buying cake <laughs> on my way out of here. But <laughs> absolutely, but absolutely. Um, so that helps me bridge to the next question, which is actually about what are the main issues in the media industry that are of concern when it comes to better practices in ESG? Yeah, I think. This, this, I guess let's start with the, as I mentioned before, the sort of complex and fragmented nature of the media landscape generally, and digital more specifically. Yeah. Uh, there are just thousands of publishers out there and to get an ad served to their site involves thousands of intermediaries. I mean, just trying for an advertiser to try and figure out where their ads are actually going to be placed is a problem in itself. You know, a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of wastage, there's a lot of ad fraud, there's a lot of uh, money going to sites that no one views. Uh, so that in itself is, is sort of a problem. Geographies, channels, um, I think. And on top of that, there is the issue of how do you even set a baseline for it? You know, where do you even start to say, what's the what's the benchmark here? What yeah. what do we do? Because you have to set a bench baseline to say, hey, we, we are going to take these five steps yeah. to improve our ESG and our digital media. Well, what are they unless you're starting from somewhere? So I think that's kind of been... Um, one of the issues. I think secondly, um, there are just so many issues to look at. I mean, you're talking about, you know, informed privacy consent, as you're saying about data there, yeah. you know, how much of our data yeah. is just taken and without our consent, yeah. um, misinformation, disinformation, you know, ads on children's well-being and, you know, that kind of thing. There are just so many things to look at in the sort of all-encompassing ESG space. Um, and as an advertiser, what what are the benchmarks you're going to look at to improve? And what of these list of things are you going to tackle? You can't do everything at once. You've got to pick out what's most meaningful to you as part of your sort of overall company ESG strategy. For the sake of this podcast, which two do you think we need to really dive into? I mean, my view would be let's, let's just look at sort of carbon emissions and responsible okay. media because they're kind of the sort of... If, I, if, if there is such a thing as a garden variety, they're probably the ones that most people, I think, would start with, yeah. depending on your industry, obviously. But I think let's start with just those two for the time being. And, you know, even responsible media includes things like misinformation and disinformation and whether or not you actually gave consent for someone to put a cookie on your website, <laughs> <laughs> on, your, on your laptop, sorry, not your website. So looking at digital more specifically, what are the environmental concerns that we're talking about? Um, I mean, if you go back to the 70s, um, you probably were served somewhere in the region of five to a thousand ads a day, you know, in the Western developed world, if I can put it that way. Um, today, you probably see anywhere between six and 10, 6,000 and 10,000 wow. ads per day. And a lot of that is driven by, you know, you open your phone and you look at a news channel and there is a whole load of ads being showed to you, right? Yeah. So um, I don't think we realize that today ads are literally everywhere. We may not even understand and even recognize that. Um, as I mentioned, I think carbon emissions in advertising uh, has been large, has overlooked. Um, I don't think we've spent enough time so far. And I think now there's a sort of an inflection point to say, you know, we've been on this journey. We've moved so fast between 2016 and today. Yeah. Uh, so much of our money is now going to digital. Let's take a breath here and see, you know, how how are we contributing to this problem? Um, and I guess, you know, on top of that, you also have the actual creation of the ads as well. Um, yeah. You know, we've all seen the sort of out the digital out of home, which is now the new thing. It's not new, but, you know, we're seeing more and more complex digital out of home ads, you know, where you, you see the billboard and the lion comes out of the billboard. Um, just think about the 
you know, the CPU usage that's required to render that digital out of home ad. Um, it's a lot more than just the sort of a picture being shown. It requires a lot more energy to render that kind of digital out of home ad. Um, so the more complex the ads, um, the more CPU usage and the more CPU usage, more energy is required to, to make that happen. There was, a, there was one statistic that I, you know, when I was doing a little bit of homework for this, um, yeah. you know, a double-sided digital bus stop advertising screen, this was in the UK actually, consumes four times more electricity than the average British home. So that was one. And then the second was the energy needed to power the advertising in Times Square in New York has been enough estimated as enough to power around 160,000 homes, according to earth.org. Wow. You know, so this is, this is significant Seriously. energy mm. that's, um, that's required in here. You know, we're thinking that, we're estimating really that digital advertising uh, activities generate approximately 3.5% of global greenhouse gases, which is an awful lot of energy. Um, and then one other sort of fact on this was business to consumer emails, 376 billion of them a day will be sent by 2025, which is when you consider there's only 4.4 billion people with email access, you know, that's pretty serious <laughs> email activity. Remember, it's for business to consumer emails. So this is not just, B2B this is not emails between you stuff. and I, this is business to consumer emails. Um, and that, and remember, a single email emits approximately four grams of carbon dioxide. So, you know, this is an awful lot of carbon that's being um, <laughs> emitted. So, so we did a study actually with uh, Ubiquity and Scope 3. So Scope 3 is one of the, the companies that um, manages this space or does a lot of an analysis in this space. Um, we looked at 116 billion digital display ad impressions from 43 advertisers in 11 markets. Um, one of the things that really hit home to me was um, an, if an ad being served to your laptop, um, if it were cigarette smoke, um, would produce a puff of carbon dioxide that would be big enough for you to see it. So you can imagine when I said earlier on, six to 10,000 ads a day. Can you imagine if you sat at your laptop all day, you'd have a room full of cigarette smoke, right? From the amount wow. of ads that are served to your, to, your, um, to your laptop during the day or to you during the day. Some of these stats are really scary. And is it so, and with, with summarizing this, and I think we could put this into a nice visual, do, is it something that we, we, we aren't taking seriously enough? Uh, I, think we're, I think we're taking it seriously. I just don't think, again, we're back to the measures. How do you even get your arms around quantifying, you know, carbon emissions per thousand impressions? That's the, that's the metric we use at Ubiquity to help advertisers. What is the carbon emissions? Um, there was another stat, which was, um, I think, an, an advertising campaign. Um, uh, as part of the same study, um, a single digital ad campaign delivering a million impressions emits the same carbon footprint as a round trip from Boston to London. Oh, wow. Right, so think about how many trees have to be, you know, planted and grown just to, you know, um, cover off the the carbon emissions from a single ad campaign of a million impressions. That's quite a lot of carbon being produced. So again, we have to think back as, go one step back from the creative. Do we even need to do the campaign? You mm. know, If we do the campaign, how are we producing the creative assets? If we're producing the creative assets, what's the carbon emissions of those assets? What's the carbon emissions of the digital supply chain? And does it land on sites that are <laughs> responsible? You pulled out some incredible, tangible stats that I don't think many marketeers I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of, like, that are really shocking. And they really hit home into really thinking about what activities we're planning. So it's not just about better planning with your media agency, but it's about better planning at a business level as well, right? For me, these, I mean, things like, you know, a puff of carbon dioxide from an ad, you can visualize that. Yeah. It's very difficult for you to, to visualize carbon emissions per thousand impressions, right? It does, it's, not, it's not meaningful to people. But when you start turning it into these kind of what is this what is the actions we have to take in the real world what would my office look like with all this carbon Smoke. in the atmosphere <laughs> in my office it would be you know crazy right it really brings a question to my mind right now is is that is it on us as consumers to actually turn around and say enough less 
minimalism? Or is it a conscious choice that brands and marketeers and the media industry has to look at and say, plan better, do less, send out better brand messages. And we talked about this on an earlier episode about brand purpose. If you have a clear brand purpose with clear values, this would then better inform your decisions when it comes to media planning, media buying. And, and you can think about, as you've just demonstrated actively with some really profound stat stats, you can affect environmental impact through your media buying decisions. Yeah, I think, you know, from a consumer perspective, I don't think any of us really want to see ads. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, now even the, the streaming sites are charging for you to not <laughs> to not see ads. Um, so I mean, I, we're going to be out of jobs quickly with that <laughs> if I carry on down this line of questioning. But, um, no, but more seriously, yes. Uh, and, and I think that's I think that's part of the problem. It's how do how do these sites fund themselves mm. um, without them? And it's this seems to be the, the business model. It's like you know they fund themselves from advertising. I mean, has it ever changed? Has it ever changed in history? I mean, when you had a newspaper back in the seventies, they still sold ads to actually produce the newspaper, right? Yeah. So um, I think there's there's yes, I think consumers. Ultimately, eyeballs equals money for publishers um, and public by selling ads. So I think from that perspective, ultimately, if there was a way that we could, you know, see these sites without generating the ads, it would be absolutely fantastic. But they, you know, legitimate sites, I don't think are necessarily the problem. It's all the illegitimate sites that are created for the sole purpose of gathering money. It's the monetization. It's, yeah. you know, the factories of people sitting creating web pages, then using bots to visit those web pages thousands and thousands of times Wasted. to make them look like they are legitimate sites. Then yeah. they take all of that ad inventory and they load it into an ad exchange to be sold in a programmatic way. And those ads are never seen by anybody who's a real life person. It also comes back to something we just, one more point from another podcast, which really gives it a good red thread through what we're discussing with some of the leaders in the region, which is, if you had not just KPIs, but if you had impactful outcomes, then you'd be able to actually quantify, as you talked about earlier, but also be able to report back on and see where you can make an impact. And yeah. that this is what I, one of the points to take away from today is to actually look at that and say, where is there wastage in my in my media buying, in, in, in the KPIs I'm seeing in terms of eyeballs versus purchase? And so... How does the industry tackle this? Sure, I mean, I think um, I think there's there's a there's a number of um, there's a number of these. Um, there was a good article actually written by a lady called Amy Williams um, for Walk, which is one of the other advertising um, groups, and she gave a sort of a six point plan, which I thought was quite relevant for this for this discussion. Um, the first she said was measure, 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 yeah. which is what I kind of said before, you yeah. know. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to benchmark your carbon output, mm -hmm. and you've got to start that. Um, you know what are we dealing with? Um, and there's a number of industry tools that you can use. There's the Ad Green Carbon Calculator, which is a low, which is uh, with a from the low carbon arm of the Advertising Association. Uh, Green Ad Tag and Institute of Practitioners in Advertising also have the Media Carbon Calculator as well. So you know you have to start there. You have to do some inflection and say to yourself, you know. What are we going to try and measure here? What are we going to try and tackle? Um, carbon off offsetting, she, I mean, I think that's a little bit of a tricky one to do. You know, she talks a little bit about purchasing carbon credits, but I think that's a little bit tricky. But um, manage your assets. So as I mentioned before, the more complex your creative is, the more CPU usage there is. How often do we consider the complexity and not just the complexity of the ad? How often do we think about flying to a far off land to yeah. shoot in a desert with a helicopter? You know, just the creative alone is is one of those challenges. Um, think about when you're advertising. You know, the busier the energy grid, the more uh, carbon intensive it becomes, essentially. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, that busyness happens at prime time, which is when everyone wants to advertise. No one wants to advertise at four o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> um, everyone wants to advertise during prime time. But, you know, it's something there that maybe people should consider. Um, Embrace the digital path optimization. You know, as I mentioned, there are thousands of intermediaries here, all taking a little nibble, not only of your budget, also 
emitting carbon emissions. Uh, and the more intermediaries you have in that supply chain, the less transparency you have, just from a pure effectiveness perspective, less transparency you have as to where your ad actually ends up. Mm -hmm. You know, where does it actually get served to in the end? If you buy from an ad exchange, an ad exchange may not have the inventory you want. They'll buy from another ad exchange. So there's money lost, there's carbon emissions, and you don't know where that ad ultimately ends up. Um, and then I guess, you know, the last one on her list, which I thought was a really good one, was innovate intelligently. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so many companies have been dabbling in the metaverse. Um, what's your goal in the metaverse? You know, as an advertiser, what is it you're trying to do? I'm, I'm sure AI is going to fall into that category now. It's, you know, um, what is the goal here? You know, have a strategy about, you know, truly think from a carbon emission perspective, think mm -hmm. on those terms. I mean, there may be other sort of strategic objectives, but do you really need to have a presence in the metaverse? Do you really need to use AI to generate your next creative ad? Or could you do it the good old fashioned way, right? Um, so that's kind of all what I would say about sort of what the advertisers can do uh, to sort of, you know, continue your question about who's responsible. Yeah. Um, agencies, you know, there is the ad, ad net zero initiative in the UK, which is between ISBAR and the IPA. They created actually an ad net zero five point action plan in 2020, 2020 uh, to, uh, which and their pledge was basically to reduce carbon emissions across the UK advertising operations. Um, to net zero by 2030. And actually, that's now being rolled out to other global markets. Um, those are global advertising companies, along with companies like Unilever, Google, Meta, Sky, and then the advertising industry bodies, the ANA, the WFA. Um, they've also signed up to that to try and roll out that ad, ad net zero program. And of course, there are other initiatives in advertising agencies. You know, Ad Green is one of them. Um, and, they, and enabling agencies to work out, you know, the carbon footprint of things like motion stills, audio projects, actually quite a nice calculator to easy to use. Um, but, you know, there's there's many, many people have a role to play in that space, I think. I do like innovate inter intelligently as well, because many people, marketeers may feel like ESG could hinder creativity. But we've heard from two speakers now in this series who have actually said, actually, it gives marketeers an opportunity to be more creative. Uh, yeah. And that, that that really and and the second point I'll take away from so so on this is that consumer side but agency side and it's good to see the initiatives from the UK actually being rolled out globally uh, where like you said it's a pivotal moment to an earlier question I asked right now in the media industry part of marketing where people are actually setting out plans to tackle tackle carbon but the second of the two issues that we discussed is looking at responsible media and social issues and. We're seeing with so many more digital tools being accessible, social impact is something that really comes to the fore here. So this is the second issue we wanted to talk about of the two, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this one is you know, really about sort of, along with not knowing where you're at, the amount of money you're spending in producing these ads and showing these ads, we really now start to talk about the sort of last bit, bit of it, piece of it, which is where do they actually land? Mm. Um, and this is where, you know, advertisers may be inadvertently funneling money to hate speech sites, uh, disinformation, fake news, or what we sort of class as questionable journalism credibility. Um, everyone has an opinion of what credible journalism is, <laughs> depends on whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, right? They, have, <laughs> they both have broadly different views on what's... On, uh, what's uh, what fake news. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then there's many sites, you know, probably in 2020, actually, you know, COVID conspiracy sites, pushing vaccine conspiracies, fake cures, uh, many of that kind of thing. I mean, you know, probably the most recent uh, when we're thinking about this space and responsible media is Twitter. Um, you know, in April this year, Twitter began removing the blue ticks. Mm. Now, when you consider the context that, you know, a lot of people today get their news bottom up, you know, they're getting yeah. it from Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. They're not necessarily going and watching Sky News or BBC or CNN or any of the sort of major, hopefully qualified major news networks. Yeah. They're getting it bottom up. And Twitter is one of those examples where, you know, they removed this blue tick, apparently in the pursuit of profitability. Um, actually, as a result of it, their revenue's down 59% year on year. Um, but the question here is, is that now essentially anybody can be paid to be verified. Um, that effect, in my view, at least in my humble opinion, that kind of creates a sort of 
written deep fake. So if I can pay to be verified as Donald Trump, for example, um, how many people are going to believe that I am Donald Trump or from the real Donald Trump or the, you know, five other Donald Trumps, you know? <laughs> and therein lies sort of the, the, the challenge with that is you can, you can p pretend to be somebody else and start, you know, talking narratives about things that may not necessarily be, um, you know, truthful. Um, you know, it's not just about the communication and uh, and the message. It's about who's giving that message, right? That's that's the essence of communication. It's and credibility. Credibility and the name of being verified with a blue tick kind of gives it credibility, even if it's not credible. Hmm. Um, and then there's other aspects to it as well. We touched earlier on about um, you know consent and you know and the data game. We did a study in 2020. Um, with the, again the ubiquity with the, w, the World Federation of Advertisers, we found 92.6% um, of sites were depositing cookies um, before consent was given, and 32% were firing those cookies before consent was given. Mm. Right. So you know this is this is them gathering data from you, placing that cookie on your web on your laptop, and gathering data about you before you were you were even given the before clicking accept all cookies. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the, the data part of it. Um, there was uh, a, a report done by Nielsen in 2021 called Hope and Action. Um, they identified 1,200 websites containing hate speech of, Asian Amer of people of Asian American descent. Um, and they isolated the offensive content and identified thousands of ad occurrences between January and March of that year. Um, $153 million was spent on digital ads on those anti-Asian rhetoric sites. You know, so that's where your money is ending up. Now, I doubt that any of the advertisers involved in that knew that even knew that their ads were ending up on those sites. I'm sure most of them would be horrified to find out that kind of information. Um, so again, it all comes from this sort of use of the programmatic supply chain and this sort of as soon as you enter this long supply chain with thousands of intermediaries involved and buying from exchanges, these exchanges are being polluted by inventory like this. You know, a DSP that's used to buy from these ad exchanges can't tell the difference between what is good and bad quality news or what is fake news and real news. It can't tell that difference. All it does is say, this site meets all of the criteria that my advertiser wants. I display will the ad. display the ad. Then Again, it comes back to another question I asked earlier, but I really want to get into it a little bit more as well as to say, maybe I've already answered it by saying it's about having impactful, maybe it's about having impactful outcomes. And is it on the brand or the marketing side, the, the, the brand side, the business side to actually say, I want to know more, question more yeah. uh, of their media agencies to find out, am I displaying my, are my ads being displayed in credible websites? That's a KPI that maybe all marketeers should add to their list of KPIs. And how deep do we really need to go? Is it the case that people should be asking? Is that a recommendation we're giving to our audience today? Yeah, I mean, uh, we see from the audits we carry out, when you have an educated advertiser, when we're carrying out you know, media efficiency and performance or even you know, transparency in where their money is spent, those advertisers who truly understand the digital industry um, we find that certainly the, what can I call it, the erroneous spend in these kind of sites, wasted money is reduced significantly because they've taken time out to educate themselves about that. So I think education from the advertiser, it has to start there. Yeah. And we have to impose, as advertisers have to impose that on the media agencies and they have a similar responsibility as well. Yeah. You know, they've, they've obviously got to act in the best interests of their client um, they've also got to make money and they're not charities, but they also have to make sure that they, you know, are as educated as well as the advertisers. We all have a joint responsibility in this supply chain. Um, I think maybe some of the publishers themselves, you know, certainly the ones who are, are creating things like made for advertising sites, um, and they are there solely for the purpose of making money. You know, they produce 15% uh, Again, one of the studies we did, 15% of, of um, digital sites that the advertisers spent their money on was made for advertising sites. So that's kind of sites that do things like, you know, 30, um, 30 celebrity uh, red carpet outfit fails. It's that kind of stuff. You know, you see it in Facebook and, and they're made for advertising sites. When you go on those sites, um, the ad page, the page is crowded by ads. 
Um, they are producing high carbon emissions, low quality content, um, and they're really adding no value to you as an advertiser. Um, and that's just kind of one example of that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, again, if we're educated in this supply chain, we're educated about our industry, we have to understand who the bad actors are. Who are the fake websites? Who are those who are real websites but producing this kind of hate speech and rhetoric, I think, is, is a great concern. But I think on top of that, um, you know, I think governments are now yep. taking a greater interest in this. I think there's been historically, particularly in social media sites, there's kind of been this sort of view from the tech companies of, you know, kind of trust us, we got this, we know what we're doing. Um, I think the governments now are taking a stronger line on this and mm -hmm. saying, well, I think we need to maybe start policing this. One notable example that most people may have heard on a lady called Frances Horgan, uh, who was a whistleblower. You can look her up. Um, she she basically claimed that her company under investigated, uh, sorry, under invested in an adequate sized team to police their content. So she was saying it was like, yes, we're doing enough, but we're only doing just enough. We're not going to go beyond, beyond that because we still want the money to buy ads yeah so it was kind of like you can say yeah we're doing something but her opinion was it wasn't enough it's not enough and maybe and she actually also recommended that you know maybe um the minimum age be lifted for th some of these social media sites given some of the content that's on them and the questionable policing perhaps that goes on in some of these um social media sites i mean we talk about different industries and what we've seen in football more recently as well yeah. uh, of how you know, footballers are being targeted with hate speech and a range of, you know, negativity, you could say, and racial slurs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's still highly prevalent today uh, and nothing's being done to take those people down from social media. And there was also this discussion, right, about needing, you talked about blue tick, but there was also everybody needing to provide your ID just to get a, yeah. an account on social. What's your view on that? Yeah, I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, I think that, I mean, policing, I mean, for me, things like social media are like uh, what used to be the coffee shop. You know, yep. you could go into a coffee shop and you'd have a conversation with somebody, but you wouldn't stand up in the middle of the coffee shop and start swearing, at them. Start swearing. Yeah, yeah. And, and hate speech, right? Yeah. A, it wasn't socially acceptable, and B, you probably would have been thrown out by the owner, yeah. right? So in the world of the internet, you can be anybody you want to be, right? Because you don't, you're not, this, it, you don't have to be socially acceptable because no one knows who you are, right? You yep. just have a, a tagline. So then what's left? Well, then the coffee shop owner is what's yep. left. Who owns the site? Then surely policing of that mm. must come down to the sort of so-called coffee shop owner and say, hold on a minute, that's not acceptable in our in our platform. Please leave. Yep. But the challenge with it is, is what's acceptable for one is, may not be acceptable for another. And therein lies that sort of huge gray area of, of you know, back to my sort of analogy of Democrats versus Republicans, right? It's yeah. like, what do you consider to be the right way to run a country versus the wrong way? They yeah. both have opinion. So how do we go about tackling this? And, and, and I know we've touched on this about who's responsible. It's everybody, right? Um, so what would you be your advice in your, your great experience um, <laughs> to not just consumers, advertisers, government? Like, how do we collate that? I think... Um, it's like a circle for me. Ultimately, consumers can vote with their feet. They can choose where to spend their hard-earned dollars, um, and they can choose to you know, buy products and services from brands and force those brands to do take certain actions in the ESG context um, and only buy from you know, advertisers who you know, have a clear ESG agenda and they stand by that ESG agenda. Um, Advertisers, them, you know, there was a good, another good example, you know, Stop Hate for Profit campaign that was in 2020 where all the big advertisers got together and um, along with the World Federation of Advertisers and they managed to get Facebook and YouTube and Twitter to use common definitions of hate speech. So, you know, standing together as a, as a group of companies, you're stronger together than you are standing alone in that, in that way. Um, again, one of my other big concerns is, you know, there's an awful lot of money going to a few big digital players. If you remove that money from the independent, let's take news as an example, if you remove that money from independent news, they can't hire journalists. And it's those journalists that hold politicians and the government to account. Yeah. If that money is being sucked up by a few big global digital players, they then start controlling policy and lobbying and all the rest of it. 
And I think it would be useful for advertisers to consider not only just digital traditional and where their money's going, but you know, start maybe thinking about how do we support to make sure the money is spread evenly across a, you know, a number of media channels. And it's not all just going to a few big global players. I know it's very tempting and very easy yeah. to go to those big players, but start thinking about how do we maintain money flowing to real journalism? Yeah. Because it's real journalism that really holds all these people to account. Um, you know, lawmakers, as I mentioned, have really started to get involved. Governments, there's a number of bills proposed, going through various parliaments, being challenged. You know, the UK's got theirs. Germany has the Network Enforcement Act from 2017. Uh, the US has Earn It, which is all about eliminating abuse and rampant neglect. Um, and then there's agencies themselves also have to play their part and publishers also have to play their part in that space. So what we're saying effectively is the supply chain needs to come together by some kind of standards. And effectively, the adver that advertising keeps companies in business, basically. Absolutely. Well, it keeps the publishers in business. Their yeah. advertising dollars keep the publishers in business. Um, you know, there are, again, a number of uh, activities that have been ongoing. I mentioned the Institute of Practitioners. Um, you know, they did a study of their member agencies, actually. Um, and if we think about some of these other some of these other issues, such as race, gender equality, um, you know, there is a number of other sort of garden variety that need to be held accountable for as well within the within the agencies and the publishers themselves. You know, what are you doing to support a diverse supply chain? What are you doing in terms of the people you hire? Are, are there, is there a correct balance between men and women? Is there a correct diversity in the in the publishers? Is there a correct diversity in the, the, the media agencies themselves? So all of those great things that most advertisers would have within their own organization about equality and diversity, they have to impose that on their agencies and the publishers and the supply chain itself. They have to help move that in the right direction. Ultimately, money talks in this, in this game. So... We could talk for another whole episode on this particular. Now, we'll be inviting you back, surely. But what I've taken away today and what I feel marketeers can take away from, from this session is the six-point plan. That, uh, and actually, creativity can still be upheld when you're looking at better practices when it comes to ESG in the media industry. Yeah. Planning better. Um, asking more deeper questions of media agencies and working hand-in-hand -hand to actually see and 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 derive better metrics which is is my ad reaching the right website am i getting to the right audience that i want to where is my ads being displayed and demanding more you know becoming more informed and educated around where your ads are actually going in that process and the creation of those ads and the creation of those and ads the energy that goes into that and then you also have the impactful outcomes that we talked about societal impacts of that uh, there's one thing that we we did cover but i think it's important to really bring was that chart that you showed me before we started. And I think we talked about it earlier, but that itself was a start. There, there's so many startling stats that you've given us. I actually want to go back to that chart about the impact we can have as marketeers when we look at how much it takes for an ad to actually get to where we want to get it to. Yeah. I mean, there are thousands of intermediaries in there. I mean, I, I always think about start with, start with your creative. Consider just that. In its first, what is, what's the energy required to build the creative? Because after that, it's about placement yep. and all of those intermediaries, those thousands of companies involved in getting your ad from your office to the publisher's site and to ultimately to someone's desktop. Um, and on top of that, there is, you know, um, did your ad actually make it? First of all, did it make it to a legitimate site? If it did, uh, did it make it to your laptop? If it made it to your laptop, did it render correctly? And was it then viewed in a brand safe environment? They're all sort of post moving your ad yep. through the supply, your dollars through the supply chain. And I think if there was a way, and I think this is something that advertisers should start looking at, at least educate is, you know, re try and reduce the length of that, su that supply chain. And to do that, you've got to understand it. Yep. And that really is where the challenge lies today for most advertisers. Who are the companies in our supply chains? The number one question we get asked at Firm Decisions when we do audits, the advertisers come to us and say, when you audit my media agency, who are the, who are the intermediaries? What am I paying these people? So a monetary perspective, what am I paying mm -hmm. these people? Because on top of that, there is the carbon emission output just to run that supply chain. And remember, those ads are being served. You know, when you open an app on your phone, 
when you move on to something else on your phone, your app is still open underneath and ads are still being served there. Yeah. So there's energy flowing constantly just in serving ads to things that are not even being seen, looked at, not even looked at. <laughs> so I can't end without asking you from our discussion or beyond, what are your top three practical advice for marketeers to make a difference? Um, I actually have four. Um, if I if I'm allowed Enlighten if I'm us. allowed one more, um, I guess first of all, as I mentioned before, first of all, decide what it is that you um, want to measure. What you can't do everything, yeah. so let's not try and eat the elephant. Let's break it into small chunks. Yeah. What is it that are going to be priority for you to measure? The second is set the baseline. You know, what is it you have to look at those three or four things and say, yeah. what, where am I currently and where do I want to be in that? The third is really looking at sustainability and the effectiveness of the impact itself. So as I mentioned before, you know, the complexity of ad in that, the, the carbon emissions of ads bought, as I just mentioned. And then I guess if, how effective is your, is your media spend? You know, besides emissions and money wasted, are you actually achieving your advertising goals? Yeah. Because if you're not even achieving your advertising goals and you're losing money and you're polluting the environment, this is a lose-lose for any advertiser. You're not helping the... the, the the planet and you're losing money and essentially undermines the whole purpose of doing advertising in the first place. And then I guess the fourth one is social impact. You know, this is one that really comes from the soul, I think. You know, consider where your ads are shown. You know, what safeguards do you have in place as an advertiser to make sure you are not funding these kind of sites? Um, understand where your ads are currently being placed. And you can do that by getting things like ad server reports. And um, this is a little bit more sort of technical, but you can get that kind of information from your media agencies. You can see where those ads are served. The aim is you've got to stop them being served there. Um, establish what I call a sort of set of whitelist sites. It's amazing in our audits how often we look at, you know, contracts and they have a blacklist and say, please do not advertise on these sites. Well, there are millions of billions of websites, how long is that list going to get? You may yeah. as well do the opposite and say, hey, don't advertise on anything other than these sites and then build the list up over I like time. It. I like it. There was a, there was a, a good example, uh, I think I mentioned earlier on, the ANA, the American National Advertisers Association this week in their report, um, in their study, there was 44,000 websites used for approximately 20 companies. I mean, I can't even think of 40 websites, <laughs> let alone 44,000. So how much of the 44,000? And that's 20 companies in the US. Yeah who are spending on 44,000 websites. That's an enormous amount of websites. And yep. I can't imagine that more than 10 or 20% of them actually added any value. Probably 20% of, you know, it's probably me being a little bit, you know, I think probably 10% <laughs> actually added any value. Um, and then I think and most importantly, which is great for this kind of, you know, for the marketing society is, you know, stand together with other members, stand together with other members of the marketing society, stand together if you're, you know, part of the WFA or ISBAR or the ANA or any other advertising body, stand together because you're more powerful together to, you know, affect change where your ads are actually, you know, in the digital industry. Um, you're far more powerful together to make that change, as I showed in 2020, um, than you are doing it alone. You know, find out who those people are you know, part of what we're doing here today is to try and, you know, first of all, you know, enlighten people maybe a little bit about all of the variety of yeah. where carbon emissions are. Yeah. But in the advertising space, it's probably the number one spend for most advertisers. Yeah. Media is the number one spend. Um, surely this has got to be the place to start where you start thinking about, you know, how do I affect change? Because money talks. Stuart, we talked about several aspects of what we could have talked about today but we, we we really deep dive into environmental issues and social issues and at the start of the podcast we heard there were probably about eight to ten or even maybe more so i would just like to say thank you very much for making the time today to enlighten us around what we as marketeers can do practically from after listening to this podcast about educating ourselves better asking deeper questions and and actually standing together as you said rightly at the end so thank you very much for the time you've given us today and I hope to invite you back one day to discuss some of the other issues in more detail. Great. Thank you for having me on the, sh on the show. I'm, um, I'm, there's so much in this space to talk about. 
we um, hopefully I've given maybe just a, a flavor of scratch the surface a little bit and maybe considering what goes on behind the scenes in, in just in the digital web space. We haven't even talked about, <laughs> about all the other mediums and all the other aspects of marketing. We've only just talked really about digital media, but um, it is where a lot of money flows today. So thank you very much. That's all we've got time for today. Please feel free to carry on the conversation on social and let us know what you thought of this episode and get in touch if you'd like to know more about the Sustainability Squad and our planned activity. Join us for the next episode where we will hear from another leading marketing expert about marketing and ESG. Thank you. The Marketing Society Sustainability Squad podcast, leading the conversation on ESG.